Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Digital Defense. I'm Jordan Robertson, cybersecurity reporter here with Bloomberg News in Washington, D.C. This is our weekly uh, internet show on cybersecurity. And uh, today I wanted to talk to you about critical infrastructure. It's a term that's uh, thrown around a lot, especially as it pertains to the U.S. election, uh, the electric grid, and other uh, you know, elements of, uh, of U.S. infrastructure. And I wanted to fill you in on a conversation I had today with a, a senior uh, DHS official about what it actually means to be considered critical infrastructure under the government's, uh, the government's regulations. And uh, this, uh, as always, is an interactive show, so we encourage you to, uh, to submit any questions uh, you know, via the comments section. And uh, I've also separately received some emails from some, uh, some viewers with some additional questions, and uh, uh, I'll be getting to, uh, to those later. So I uh, wanted to dive right in. Um, the, uh, the concept of critical infrastructure is really important in the U.S. because if you are deemed critical infrastructure, that gives the government powers to protect your networks in ways that they can't otherwise normally do. Uh, as, uh, as most viewers will know, uh, the U.S. government has uh, pretty broad capabilities in terms of surveilling, attacking, uh, you know, uh, monitoring foreign uh, computer networks. But when it comes to computer networks inside the, the United States, uh, the rules are, you know, for good reason, uh, you know, a lot different. If you run a, a private company and your servers are your servers, the government can't just come in and say, you know, even if it's for a defensive reason, we're going to monitor your computers. We're going to put some sensors on your network and, uh, and we're going to make sure that you, can, you don't get attacked by the Russians or the Chinese or, or cyber criminals or whoever. And you know, this is a really relevant issue in light of uh, the U.S. presidential election, you know, in, where we had, uh, you know, state election systems, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, reached out to all of the state systems and said, hey, let us come in and help you protect your network from these Russian attacks, which, uh, you know, the U.S. intelligence community confirmed were happening. Uh, as uh, we, it was a, a big surprise to a lot of us that a number of states said, no way, we don't want the government's help. We don't want you anywhere near our networks. We're concerned about a federal government takeover of the election system. This was a big, a big and real concern for a lot of people. So we dug into it a little bit more, and I, I had a discussion today with uh, Suzanne Spaulding. Uh, she's uh, an undersecretary at the uh, Department of Homeland Security about this subject. Our conversation took place at a Bloomberg uh, Next conference here in D.C. And I wanted to show you uh, a graphic real quick on, uh, that kind of helped frame the discussion. These are the 16 areas that the Department of Homeland Security considers to be critical infrastructure. Some of these will be obvious. Many of these might not be. So, so you can see a few of these things here on this, this list. Again, this is, these are industries that the government has dedicated as critical infrastructure, and they have special permissions uh, in terms of uh, defensive actions the government can take. Nuclear reactors, obvious. Uh, you know, national monuments and icons, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, energy, power grid, again, makes a lot of sense, dams, agriculture and food, you know, may, maybe that doesn't make your list normally of, of things you would think about as being critical infrastructure, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the large industrial farms that we have in the United States, those are considered critical infrastructure. Uh, banking, finance, that's obvious, telecommunications, defense, those are, all, those are all pretty obvious, but if you take a look at some of these things that you wouldn't otherwise normally consider to be critical infrastructure, you start to get a sense of the scale of the challenge uh, the government has when it comes to protecting U.S. networks. I think for anything like me, you tend to have this view that, you know, uh, the government's uh, capabilities are so vast, you imagine them when a, a threat comes along like our election hack, the government could just step in and say, okay, we're going to block those attacks. Like, the NSA is everywhere. The NSA is hacked into everything. And our capabilities are so great, you would imagine that these things are kind of easy to shut off when these threats emerge. The response that we've been getting from talking to folks is like, it's just not that easy because all of this stuff, the vast majority of it, is in private hands and the government can't just go in and tell a state, we're going to take over your network. And that's for good reason, of course. So uh, you get to some of these areas like chemicals. You know, you wouldn't think of chemicals as being kind of subject to a cyber attack, uh, but those facilities, ob could, you know, could cause obvious damage to uh, both the national security, but also just the public safety if they were attacked through physical or cyber means. Uh, you know, things like, again, agriculture and food, uh, with the water system, transportation system. So this is kind of the, the, the framework to think about when you talk about what is the government responsible for protecting in the United States. Election systems fall, fall uh, within here as well. Um, 
the scale is pretty huge, and the government is not allowed to just go in and protect these things as you might expect. So what does that mean for us when we you know, want to analyze what happened uh, during, the, uh, during the presidential election? Well, uh, what, uh, what uh, Suzanne was saying in our conversation was that, uh, as we discussed on last week's uh, episode, you know, the U.S. government set up this massive kind of war room surveillance operation with the cooperation of, I think she says, she said between 38 and, 30 and 39 states allowed DHS to come in, monitor their networks, uh, you know, run some penetration testing, and do some basic kind of cyber hygiene checks on their network, uh, their networks. And as, again, as we discussed before, we, what Suzanne was saying was so interesting. She said, basically, they set up this war room, they set up this massive infrastructure, and then election night comes, and while there was you know, obviously a, a kind of a huge upset on the, the election side, on the cyber side, it's basically nothing. Like, you know, the government got reports of machines failing and, you know, websites being down, kind of the normal problems you would expect when you run a technology, uh, you know, operation of this magnitude. But when it comes to, when it comes to attacks, it was basically nothing. And there are a couple of reasons for that, which I'll get to in a second. So I want to get to a couple of questions here. Uh, you know, which companies help the government with their own security? Good question. A lot of companies you've heard of and a few that you haven't. So all of the major cybersecurity companies that you've heard of, Symantec and McAfee and, uh, you know, Tanium's a big company in this space now, uh, Palo Alto Networks, any of the big companies that help enterprises and consumers with cybersecurity, they do big business with the government as well. Google, Microsoft, you know, <laughs> all of these companies have huge contracts with the government and it's for good reason. You know, the government needs, uh, you know, cutting edge technology and uh, it can't build it all itself. So uh, those uh, large names, uh, you know, they work on the consumer side as well as the, the government and the enterprise side. Um, another question is which sectors are usually most at risk of hacks? Another good question. Well, if you look at this, if, at this chart here, you can see if you're in banking, you're going to be under attack all the time. And the financial system has pretty good safeguards uh, in place because they're attacked all the time. Uh, you know, if you get to, and energy is getting there as well. There was a major attack uh, not too long ago in Ukraine that took out the power. And that was a real kind of uh, 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 learning uh, experience for everybody as to what, uh, what happens when a cyber attack takes out the power. But these are areas that are starting to kind of get up to speed. However, if you look at this chart, I mean, the vast majority of these, these, these sectors, transportation systems, healthcare, they're not used to getting attacked the way they are now. This is, is still a very new concept for a lot of these companies. And, you know, you'll hear this from every government official you talk to, which is that the government feels stymied because it sees a lot in terms of analyzing foreign intelligence and, and blocking government systems from attacks. The government doesn't have the visibility into all this that you might expect. And that was kind of my big takeaway from the conversation with the DHS official today. Um, another question is, uh, you know, are there any laws requiring companies to conform to specific practices designed to promote critical infrastructure protection? So, it, you know, if the question is asking, you know, what are the standards that, that companies have to conform to, there are, there's a lot of guidance. There's a lot of guidance, uh, but not a lot of regulation, not as much regulation as you might expect. Uh, one great example of that is healthcare. Uh, you know, medical devices, as we've seen from recent uh, you know, demonstration hacks, are very vulnerable to hacking. Extremely vulnerable. They're tiny little computers. There's no, there's no even way you can put a lot of good security software on it. And um, you know, the, the problem that creates is the FDA regulates medical devices, but the FDA has issued guidance for how those devices should be secured. It's voluntary. Uh, you know, now if you're a responsible company, it'll try to take all the steps that you that you can to make sure your devices don't get hacked. But in the absence of any uh, you know formal regulation, uh, you know most of these industries kind of do their own thing, with the exception of a few. I mean, the, the nuclear industry is obviously uh, very heavily regulated. Uh, banking is regulated as well. Energy, uh, you know, as well. But the vast majority of these. Uh, there may be guidance, there may be, uh, you know, some proposed rules, but uh, they're, they're very often a uh, little more than that. Um, how vulnerable is Wall Street and the U.S. financial system? Short answer is, is very. Uh, you know, it's despite the fact that the banking industry, uh, you know, has a lot of experience in managing these attacks, and the U.S. government is very focused on these companies uh, in terms of trying to protect these networks, the fact of the matter is, they're still computer networks, and computer networks need humans to be able to interact with them in order to be effective. You know, you can secure the internet tomorrow by shutting it down. 
uh, you can achieve 100% security and then 100% uh, you know, uh, you know, unusability. So they're always trying to strike that balance between anytime you let people use computers, they're going to be vulnerable to hacks. Uh, the question is how do you strike that balance between uh, you know, limiting what people can do on machines, uh, which also limits the hackers. But the short answer to this is this is a huge uh, subject of uh, intense uh, concern for both the Wall Street as well as, uh, as well as the U.S. government. Because you think about like the hypothetical of what happens if a hacker gets inside a bank and you can shut something down. Let's say you shut down critical services like investment banking or trading. Huge problem. Or what happens if you manipulate data so that the, uh, the output it cannot be trusted? You're left with you know, a really big problem. And as we saw in the election, uh, you know, the, the problem wasn't so much that emails leaked. The problem was what are the implications of the, the content of that email? And the implications were some people you know, lost trust in the system or could perceive that, uh, let's say, the Democratic Party you know, was kind of in the bag for Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, versus uh, Bernie Sanders. Certainly Bernie Sanders supporters felt that way, and they felt the emails validated that fear. Um, so what you, when you deal with, with data leaks and hacks, the issue of trust is, is a big deal in terms of what happens when that data gets out. We saw that in the election, and we could see that potentially in attacks on, on Wall Street as well. Tampering with financial data could have enormous effects on the trustworthiness of that information. Um, another question here, are, are America's nuclear facilities at risk? Uh, you know, this is an area that we don't get a ton of visibility into because it is so heavily regulated. Uh, however, you know, the folks that we've talked to said that the nuclear industry suffers from the same types of vulnerabilities as any other uh, type of critical infrastructure, which is especially this shift from legacy systems, you know, systems built typically in the 60s and 70s, which are actually in some ways more secure because they are just old, they're archaic, they're proprietary, and they're not connected to anything. If they're connected to anything, it's via radio frequency at a close range. With the shift to digital, uh, what you have now is you have a lot of modern workplaces that just happen to be nuclear facilities, uh, you know, where people want to log in remotely. Security operators want to be able to log in remotely. You know, they want to use uh, tools like Microsoft, uh, you know, software. The problem that creates is you've now created an opening whereby uh, while employees and authorized uh, you know, you know, uh, individuals can access the systems, so can hackers. So you know, that's been a shift that the industry has been struggling to deal with because especially if you work in security and you're accessing sensitive systems, it's understandable why you'd create that, that, that kind of window and that opening uh, for ease of use for your employees, uh, but also it creates some pretty significant risks in terms of shutting systems down or making them operate hotter than they should. Uh, and hackers are very interested in this stuff. Uh, so are security officials as well. Um, next question is, is there a way for us to protect our digital infrastructure without infringing on the privacy rights uh, of citizens, or is it a uh, decisive give and take? I would I'd actually refer back to, you know, this DHS stuff is important for a, for a reason that's related to this question, which is you may ask, what does it mean to be deemed critical infrastructure by DHS? What that does is that allows these companies to share information with the government, including customer information. We're talking about attack information, computer network information, and there is some, uh, there's some legal cover that they're given for sharing that information with the government, which they wouldn't otherwise normally get. You'd normally be subject to FOIA requests, Freedom of, of Information Act requests, uh, lawsuits, things like that. Being falling under this designation actually gives you a lot of protection as a, uh, as a company. And the reason that's important to this question is there's a lot of push and pull between companies and the government around this very issue, which is that companies, by and large, see a lot of value in working with the federal government on security. The NSA, the FBI, DHS, CIA, they know a lot about what adversaries are doing in cyberspace. The problem becomes if you share attack data or if you let the FBI install a sensor on your network, which they do all the time with the permission of you know, breached companies, the problem is you're sending data out to the federal government that could get you in a lot of legal trouble if you are sued. And you know there are these uh, extensive agreements that are reached between companies and uh, investigating agencies you know, to, to mitigate that. However, that's the central tension. When you hear about this discussion about public interaction with private, uh, that's the concern. If you share information with the government, does it get you in trouble in court? Uh, there are a couple of wrap-up questions, and uh, I wanted to very quickly share one other piece of news that came out this week that might help uh, contextualize some of this stuff. This is a story that came out uh, recently. 
the White House confirmed pre-election warning to Russia over hacking. The reason this is significant is, remember, we talked about earlier about basically on election night, there were almost no cyber attacks. Like, and I mean that very literally. Like worldwide, there were very few cyber attacks of any major scale. I think we can look back to this kind of confidential warning from U the U.S. to Russia to, hey, guys, knock it off, uh, as an explanation why. It's a pretty clear, it's as clear a sign as I can see that uh, why one thing happened after the other. Uh, I'll take the last few questions here. And uh, the last question here is, uh, someone asked if there's a way the Canadian government can assist the U.S. in battling this issue in the short term. Do other governments ever help the U.S. when it comes to cyber attacks? Absolutely. You know, we have what's called the Five Eyes, which is the U.S. and, uh, you know, and other nations that are aligned uh, with the U.S. They share all kinds of data. You know, now there are, uh, there are countries that we don't have, the U.S. doesn't have as great a relationship with, such as Russia, uh, certain Middle Eastern countries, uh, Iran, China, where that, that sharing doesn't happen. And, and those countries are the source of many of the cyber attacks against the U.S. So when you're talking about allied countries, the information sharing tends to be pretty good. The problem becomes if you deal with countries where there isn't a lot of cooperation, uh, you know, that sharing is not so great. And I did say I wanted to get to some of these questions that, uh, that came in uh, over the internet before. Uh, this was from a, a reader in Sweden who asked, you know, in regard to the election, uh, what types of audits are the U.S. government, the DNC, the RNC, and others performing after a completed election? Uh, it's something we've touched on a little bit in the past, but the, the short answer is, the ballots are being counted now. <laughs> you know, the election was over a week ago, uh, but the actual process of counting the ballots and counting all of them is still happening. So the, the numbers are fluid. The race has been decided, of course. Uh, however, what you're seeing now is, uh, you know, the ballots are being counted, and these systems are being audited in the sense that there's supposed to be a reconciliation of uh, paper ballots when they exist, which is most places, with the computerized results of an election. So that's actually a manual process that government officials have to go through to check those outputs. Uh, you know, we're not expecting that you would see any major discrepancy outside of normal uh, kind of fluctuations. Uh, but that is, that's what's happening presently. And, uh, you know, there, uh, there will be a lot to learn, I think, from, you know, from what we've seen so far. Even if it doesn't sway the election, what, what this uh, election has shown us is that our voting system is really, really old and in need of an upgrade, and states aren't going to do that on their own. So what you have is a problem of really old computers, you know, counting votes for one of the most important things that, you know, we as citizens uh, kind of engage in civically. Uh, and they're, they're pretty unreliable. They can be pretty unreliable machines. Um, so they're going to learn a lot through that reconciliation process about, uh, you know, kind of just how flawed those old machines are. Um, so with that, I wanted to, yeah, with that, I wanted to, uh, to thank everybody from, uh, you know, for, uh, for watching. And uh, we're, we're doing this, uh, again, weekly at, at 1 p.m. Eastern. Again, want it to be a very interactive experience, so feel free to, uh, to reach out offline. Uh, to me, my, my Twitter handle is at uh, JordanR1000. Uh, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you next week. Thanks so much for watching.